Hello, everybody. I'm Liza Dunn, and welcome to our uh, latest industry webinar, um, Treatment to Over-the-Counter, a scripted talk by Dr. Sasha Kaiser. Um, I'm delighted that Sasha is presenting this to us because she is one of our first cohort of fellows that rotated through the Bayer industry ACMT rotation. Um, so this is really, really um, interesting because um, she is going to give you a, um, an overview of one of the aspects of um, things that she learned about how um, drugs get, get to be put over the counter from, from prescription to over the counter. Sasha is a second year medical toxicology fellow um, with the Rocky Mountain Poison Center and Drug Safety Center. Her career path began in medicine when she was working as a pharmacy technician then she went on to become a registered nurse. Um, and then she uh, went on to go to medical school at Florida State University. She completed her emergency medicine residency at Denver Health in Denver, Colorado, and was a chief resident there. Um, then she uh, went on to do her fellowship um, in medical toxicology. Um, and she will be finishing up this year and then moving back to her native state of Washington to work at the Washington Poison Center. Um, what we'll do uh, is maybe give it just a minute or two to see if any more people are joining. And um, then we will have you ask questions in the Q&A se session. Um, and once Sasha's finished presenting, um, we can have a little bit of a discussion as well. So maybe let's give it uh, till uh, 12.02, and then Sasha, you can take it away. Sounds good, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, as Liza mentioned, my name is Sasha Kaiser, one of the second year toxicology fellows based out of Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Safety right now. And we're gonna kind of do, talk about a couple different things. Um, one of the things is that the evolution of drug product regulation in the United States has really been very reactionary. Um, and so a lot of this is fueled by certain medical disasters that have occurred that have really influenced a lot of the drug regulation we have today. Um, and so what I want to do through this talk is I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the different events that really influenced and changed our regulation process. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the different pathways you have to being an over-the-counter drug, whether or not you go through the monograph versus the new drug application process. And then want to talk a little bit about what it takes to transition from an over-the-counter drug or from a prescription drug to an over-the-counter drug. So along the way, as we mentioned before, a lot of this has really been influenced by um, different events in history. So prior to the 1900, um, we were primarily an agriculture country. And as we started to have more influences by industry, there was a huge boom in the number of patent medications that were available. And these medications were largely sold based on their aesthetics, the way the bottles looked, the um, testimonies by different people about how this had cured this or this disease. Um, and there wasn't really any sort of regulation to um, enforce efficacy or safety with these medications. We had things things like cocaine and our alcoholic beverages to really booster the sales. There was heroin in our cough and cold medications. There was aniline dye in our mascaras um, to make our eyes look prettier that would result in uh, blindness for some people. And as we got closer to this, um, the 1900s, a lot of attention started to be paid to this. And so um, this started out in 1902 when there was an anti, uh, the diphtheria antitoxin was found to be contaminated with tetanus. And this resulted in um, 13 pediatric deaths in St. Louis. And so following that 1902, Congress passed this Biological Control Act to really try and look at some of the safety with this. This again was further influenced in 1906 uh, with the publication of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which really unmasked a lot of the unsafe and the poor manufacturing processes in both food and industry and with the drugs. Um, and so with this, Congress really moved on legislation during that time that would prevent the manufacturer um, sale or transportation of adulterated or misbranded or poisonous or deleterious foods, drugs, or medicines. In practice, what this really was is this act was focused on 
guaranteeing truth and labeling. Um, initially, it was really aimed at raising these standards for food and drug industries and continuing to support the reputations of honest companies and requiring the pharmaceutical manufacturers to meet standards for the concentration um, and purity of their product. However, the burden of proof was really on the government to show that the drug was incorrectly labeled or that the advertising or labeling was false or misbranding. And there really wasn't much teeth to it. Um, there wasn't a lot of resources or the ability to enforce this. Well, step forward a little bit further to 1937 and the uh, Mazagel company out of Tennessee. They were selling a drug called uh, sulfanilamide. Uh, that was a, one of the first sulfa antibiotics that was really being used to treat streptococcal infections in pediatric patients as well as venereal diseases in adults. Um, but unfortunately, the pills themselves were extremely bitter. And so there was um, a lot of reach by doctors and uh, patients requesting that there would be another formulation of the product so that they would be more likely to take it, that it was a more palatable medication. Um, so on request of this, the company looked at creating a liquid that could dissolve the compound and have a more pleasant taste for this. In October of 1937, 240 gallons of sulfonilamide elixir were distributed throughout the United States. And within the first week, um, first one to two weeks, they started to see deaths that were temporarily associated with this. When they went to the um, manufacturing site to do some tests, they found that it was not the sulfonilamide that was the toxin, but instead the solvent diethylene glycol, which was responsible for the neurotoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Um, and so the FDA started to get word of this, uh, and they were actually able to be involved because there was an error with the branding. Elixir implies that there is alcohol in the drug product itself, uh, and there was no alcohol in this. Um, and so because of this misbranding, the FDA was able to pull a lot of these products and start this recall process versus if this had been labeled a solution, there would have been a lot more hindrances for the government to do this. In the four weeks that followed, they were able to recall about 90% of their products. Um, but at that time, we had already had 107 deaths. And still, really, after the, this tragedy, there was a lot of consumer advocacy groups that were pushing for stronger legislation to really protect our, um, our consumers. Um, and so what happened was the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, what this did is it really mandated pre-market approval of all new drugs such that the manufacturer would have to prove to the FDA that these new drugs were safe um, before they could be sold, really prohibited false therapeutic claims, and it had kind of five big items. It required companies to list the ingredients on each project label. It required companies to provide the known risks concerning the use of the products to physician or pharmacists. It made illegal the misbranding of foods or medicinal products. Uh, and it, for the first time, it really required the companies to test their products for safety prior to selling it. Uh, drugs already marketed before 1938 were exempt or grandfathered in. Um, and it really, um, in addition to this, it kind of brought the cosmetics and medical devices under their uh, control um, for, by the federal government and focused on some of the labeling for safe use. About 10 years later, we have the Durham-Humphrey Amendment of 1951. And what this really did is it established that there are two types of drugs. There are legend drugs, also known as prescription, and there are over-the-counter drugs. And this required that any drug that is habit-forming or potentially harmful to be dispensed needs to be dispensed under the supervision of a healthcare practitioner um, as a prescription drug and must carry the statement, caution, federal law prohibits dispensing without prescription. Prior to this, you still had some of these categories, but it was really up to the manufacturer to decide whether or not this was a prescription drug. Uh, and there was some benefits beforehand about whether or not they kept it as an OTC or prescription versus with this rule in 1951, this was very established as far as what was considered safe versus not safe. Um, then in following that, we need another disaster. Uh, so from 1957 to 1961, we see the release of thalidomide. Uh, this was initially marketed as a tranquilizer or a sedative, um, but during this time, they really realized that it was pretty potent as an anti-emetic. 
Um, and so during that four year span, there was about 10,000 children that were born in 46 different countries to mothers who'd been exposed to this. And they were born with pretty significant limb or fat deformities and other um, fetal abnormalities. Um, but we didn't really see this in the United States to that extent. And there was a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one of them is that our process for reviewing this was burdensome and slow. Um, but the other part of this was that the physician who was overlooking this process recognized that a lot of the safety data was more anecdotal as opposed to true studies. Uh, and she was actually concerned for some peripheral neurotoxicity with this. Um, and so as she was reviewing this, um, and it took the time, by the time that she was going through this process, we actually had had notification of this huge signal of teratogenic concerns related to this drug. Um, and with this, there was a lot of public awareness of this that, man, uh, that resulted in legislation moving through Congress to really make people aware of what drugs need to prove um, some safety and efficacy. Um, before this could be marketed. And this really looked at stricter agency controls over your drug trials to make sure that these met criteria to be safe to be used. So like before, this set about a couple of big changes in the way our drugs were regulated. One was that this required the manufacturer to prove the effectiveness of the drug products before they go on market and afterward to report any severe or serious side effects. Secondly, it required the evidence of effectiveness be based on adequate and well-controlled clinical trials conducted by qualified experts, and study subjects would have to um, give their informed consent to participate in the study. It gave the FDA 180 days to approve no drug applications and required that FDA approval before the drug could be marketed in the United States. Um, we did still see a small amount of thalidomide exposures in the U.S. because the drug was available on an investigational basis. Um, and so there still was about uh, 20,000 patients that had access to this. Not all of them were pregnant, but this made that no longer available. They had to prove that this drug was safe before they could do that. Um, it allowed the FDA to set good manufacturing practices for industry and mandated regular inspections for production facilities. It mandated that the FDA conduct a retrospective evaluation of the effectiveness of the drugs um, and the safety of those that uh, between 1938 and 1962. It transferred to the FDA control of prescription drug advertising, so to make sure that they included accurate information about side effects. Um, and then in addition to that, it controlled the marketing of generic drugs to keep them from being sold as expensive medications under new trademarks. So now we have all of these drugs that are on the market that prior to 1937 don't have a lot of safety um, or efficacy. Between 1937 to 1962, you have um, differences as far as the ones that were associated or evaluated for safety and efficacy. And the, um, the FDA really realized that there is all of these drugs that are out there um, that they need to review to make sure that they are safe for consumers. At that time, the FDA estimated there were between 100,000 to 500,000 different OTC drug products on the market uh, made up of hundreds of different active ingredients. And in order to look at reviewing these, the FDA proposed an OTC drug review, which was a mechanism through which currently marketed over-the-counter drug products uh, that were marketed prior to 1972 could be determined whether or not they were recognized as being safe and effective and whether or not they could be distributed uh, to the general public. Uh, and so this was meant to be a three phase process where these drugs could be reviewed, evaluated, and then continue to be marketed as generally recognized as safe and effective. Additionally, some of the changes with our drug regulation occurred in 1999 when there was a big standardization of all of the over-counter drugs as far as what was required on the label and how the label was formatted. And then jump forward to 2020, not only uh, coronavirus, but there's also a push for monograph reform. So they realized that the process that had been in place in 1972 had a lot of limitations to it and was more burdensome and more timely than they initially thought. And so there was moves to try and look at changing that process to be more efficient. So switching back to our over-the-counter, what really does it mean to be over-the-counter? 
Well, in general, this is a drug product that's been marketed over a period of time that has been shown to have a good safety profile, that is low potential for misuse or abuse, and really benefits the consumer to have it available as self-medication when properly labeling is in place and it's been approved by the healthcare facility or healthcare authorities. When we are looking at what drugs would meet criteria for this, really you wanna make sure that this is a drug that the consumer can appropriately interact outside of having a healthcare provider oversight. So this consumer must be able to diagnose that they have a condition. They must be able to select whether or not their personal medical history puts them um, at the ability to continue to take this medication. Uh, and they must be able to treat and manage it without the oversight of this healthcare professional. We also want to make sure that the product is created under good manufacturing processes. And so these are really minimal requirements for the methods, facilities, and controls used in manufacturing, processing, and packaging of the drug product. These regulations make sure that the product is safe for use and that it has ingredients and strengths that it claims to have. We also want to make sure that the label is standardized and so that a person in Tennessee is having the same label as a person in Washington and so that they can use the drug at the same level and they, uh, there's not discrepancies. We want to make sure that there's low abuse potential and we want to make sure that the benefit of having this widely available outweighs the potential risks of having it not be world. So when we talk about this, there is these two different pathways. You have your monograph pathway and your new drug application. Um, both of these have a regulation and approval by the FDA, but the mechanisms are different. One of the big difference with this is a NDA or a new drug application really is the approval to sell a, a specific finished drug product versus an OTC monograph where you're really focusing on the safety and efficacy of one or more active ingredients within a drug therapeutic category. Um, with this, if you, are, if you have a drug that has been generally recognized as being safe and effective, that is consistent with a monograph that has already been in place, then you can go ahead and market your drug without having any additional um, submission to the FDA beforehand without having pre-market approval versus an NDA, you have to submit clinical safety data. You have to submit your dossier in order to go ahead and market your drug. So some examples of this are, for instance, if you have a daytime antihistamine drug product for over-the-counter human use, there is a monograph that really defines what the term um, antihistamine is. It lists the active ingredients within established dosage limits that may be used for the antihistamine. And it requires that certain labeling accompany these drug products. Um, and as long as you meet all of these criteria within the monograph, then you can go ahead and continue to market your product or um, create and market a product. If you don't meet any of these criteria, if you have differences in your active ingredients, your dosage, your formulation, then you would have to go through an NDA, a new drug application, and submit your data to the FDA prior to getting approval to have this drug listed as over the counter. So we're going to talk a little bit about the monograph history um, and what this is. So again, we have in the 1970s, a huge array of different drugs within different regulation categories. You have some prior to 1968 that didn't, that had safety data, but didn't have efficacy data. You had some before 1938 that didn't have safety or efficacy. And so the FDA is really trying to figure out how to review all these products to make sure that they are safe for consumer use. Um, and within these 100,000 to 500,000 different drug products that were available, the FDA uh, combined these all into 26 broad therapeutic categories comprising of about 200 different active ingredients. And what their plan was, was to take these and review them systematically in a uh, therapeutic group basis, to go through a expert review panel, through a three-step process that really determine whether or not your drug met criteria to be generally recognized as safe or effective. This is also known as GRACE. Throughout this process, you would have uh, different categories. You would be generally recognized as safe and effective, which is category one. You would be not grace or category three in this is you cannot determine um, with the information available right now if this drug could be considered safe and effective. 
So what is grace? At minimum, the general acceptance of a product as grace must be supported by the same quantity and quality of scientific and clinical data necessary to support the approval of a new drug application. In order to meet this determination, this designation, the drug must satisfy three different criteria. First, your particular drug must have undergone adequate, well-controlled clinical investigation to establish your safety and efficacy. Second, the investigation must be published in scientific literature and available to experts. And third, experts must agree based on the current studies that the product is safe and effective for intended use. As we mentioned before, this is a three-phase process. So with this, you have your first phase, which is the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Within this, you have your 26 different therapeutic categories, and you have an advisory panel for each category. This advisory panel is made up of experts, including toxicologists, pharmacists, industry and consumer representatives, who are there to review the information um, out there about this medication. So what happens is this starts with the FDA commissioner publishing a notice in the Federal Registrar calling upon any interested persons to submit specified data and information to be reviewed by the advisory panel. The advisory panel will take this information, review it, and afterwards they would submit to the FDA a report containing the conclusions and recommendations regarding whether or not the active ingredients within these related conditions within this drug category were considered uh, category one, generally recognized as safe and effective, category two, not grace, or category three, there's not really enough data one way or the other to say right now. This would then um, be published in the Federal Registrar and be um, available to the public for them to have a comment period. The second phase of this is the FDA would take the advisory review panel recommendations, they would take the uh, public commentary, and they would publish a tentative final monograph. Uh, which includes all of this information, including what category these in, and go ahead and publish that in the public registrar, as well as if there's any other new information that's come about during that time frame. This information uh, would then be again available for a public commentary. Um, and following which we would move to our third step, which are our final monograph. So with this, the FDA is going to take any comments or replies to your tentative final monograph. They're going to take, again, any new data that has since come into, um, that has since become available since this process started, and they're going to publish your final order or final monograph, which really establishes the standards and labeling in the uh, over-the-counter drug category for this therapeutic condition. At the end of this, you are no longer a category one, category two, category three. If you meet all of the requirements in this monograph, then you are considered generally recognized as safe and effective. Um, and so with this, you can then look at marketing a drug as long as you meet those stipulations. So what is a monograph? Well, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as a recipe book or a rule book, but really what it is, is it is a bunch of rules and regulations that say whether or not your drug meets criteria to be marketed within this therapeutic class, within these indications. Uh, within this monograph, you have a preamble, you have the acceptable in active ingredients and combinations of active ingredients that can be used within this category. You have your uses and indications. You have your dosages and formulations that are allowed within the monograph. Uh, warnings, directions for use, and again, if you meet all these criteria you are, uh, that are consistent with this, then you are considered generally recognized and safe and effective, and you can go ahead and market your drug. There are some benefits to this. Uh, one of them is you don't have to submit a dossier prior to marketing your drug. This saves you a lot of time, money, effort, and resources to get your drug out to the market. There's lighter regulatory requirements. Uh, oftentimes it's a quicker turnaround uh, in order to have your drug available to consumers. Uh, and there's not preclinical study submission as opposed to an NDA. But some of the negatives are you don't have any exclusivity. If you, your company was the one who did all of the works to get this monograph approved, um, somebody, as soon as that monograph is published, they can start marketing their drug as long as it meets all those criteria. Um, and so you don't have a lot of return despite the amount of resources you put into this. You're also really limited in your ingredients, your indications, your dosage formulations to the monograph. And so remember too, 
that this is all uh, starting in 1972. And there's been a lot of technology changes throughout the last 40, 50 years. And with these changes, those are not necessarily highlighted in the monograph. And so if you decide that you have a new formulation that is better for patients, you have a mousse as opposed to a cream, you can't submit it as a monograph item because it is a new formulation. And so you would have to go through an NDA or a new drug application. So then we start looking at potentially reforming some of this process. Initially, this was meant to be this sleek, efficient beast that would just get through all of these hundreds of thousands of products that were out there to really establish safety. And what we found is that this was actually pretty arduous, burdensome. It took a really prolonged time period to get through this rulemaking process. Um, and so, uh, and then two, there was a lot of liability because a lot of times these medications would be delayed in getting through the finalized monograph. As of December 2019, what they found is the FDA said that, you know, seven of the 26 original OTC monograph categories had no final monograph in effect. And of the 17 that did have a final monograph in effect, 12 had proposed changes. And so this is looking decades later and you still don't have a final monograph. To give you an example, acetaminophen had a tentative final monograph that was published in 1988. And at the time that we were looking at reform, it still had not been finalized. And this puts your, um, your manufacturer at potential legal liability because their drug has not been fully vetted through a final monograph. And it also results in potential safety concerns because it is such a prolonged process to go through the rulemaking, to go through these three phases, uh, that safety concerns for things that need pretty swift changes. So one of the examples of where this started to be a problem was in 2004 to 2005, there was about 1,500 pediatric patients under the age of two that were seen in our emergency departments uh, for adverse effects from taking cough and cold medications. There was actually a citizen petition to the FDA to say, we need to change this monograph. We need to change the way that this is worded because the pediatric patient, the, we don't have the data to say that this is really safe to use in those. And while the FDA did um, do consumer warnings um, and notifications, they actually never pulled the monograph. And so all of the, a lot of the reformatting of the labels were voluntarily done by manufacturers because it's not good to have your product associated with uh, morbidity or mortality um, and have significant side effects from it. And so they wanted to make sure that this was safe, but it just goes to show you how hard it can be when you are going through this multi-step process to quickly change things if you need to from a safety standpoint. So in looking at this, there was a couple of goals. When we are looking at changing the process, we really wanted to improve it by transitioning from a rulemaking um, process to an administrative order. Uh, we wanted to improve the efficiency, the timeliness, the predictability of getting out those finalized monographs. We wanted to encourage and facilitate innovation. Again, if there is now available a new formulation or a new route that wasn't noted prior to this, we want to make sure that you can continue to market your product as long as it's generally recognized as safe and effective, especially if it will benefit the consumer to have those new technologies available to them. We want to establish a process to rapidly address your safety concerns. So with how quickly things can change, we want to be able to rapidly change our labeling or rapidly change the way things are advertised to make sure that this is consistent with being safe for your consumer. We want to finalize pending monographs. We want to make sure that this is still not a decade out process where we don't have a monograph that's been finalized for products that were potentially marketed as early as the 1900s. Um, and we want to provide the FDA with resources to support these. One of the things that we've realized that a lot of this was a resource limited problem. Uh, and so looking at doing things like user fees potentially gives the FDA more resources to go through this process to make these medications available and to do this more efficiently. In March 27th of 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act um, was signed into law. 
This primarily was aimed at response efforts and economic impact um, to aid response efforts and economic impact of COVID-19. Um, but additionally, there were some statutory provisions that really reformed and modernized the OTC monograph drug regulation. Again, focusing on transitioning from a rulemaking to administrative order process, uh, focusing on how we are going to revise and amend the OTC monographs, um, and really giving the FDA authority and the resources to get through this, uh, to give them the the additional resources they needed to regulate things in a timely manner. With this law, it was broken into a five-year span. So the first three years were really devoted to creating the infrastructure that was needed to timely evaluate these drugs. Uh, and this requires hiring new staff, training this new staff, getting a uh, situation in place where you can implement these. And then by year four and five, after we have this established, there are some performance goals that the FDA has to meet to show that this is effective, to show that this is a continued process that needs to be uh, reenacted um, so that we can continue to benefit uh, from these changes. So there are some changes that have occurred with our CARES Act. The things that are going to stay the same is this is going to continue to be an ingredient based review. The active ingredients are going to continue to be grouped by therapeutic category. Uh, it will continue to determine uh, if whether or not your active ingredient meets grace designation. Uh, drugs that continue to comply with your OTC monograph and other applicable requirements can be marketed without going through FDA approval. And we're going to continue to elicit public commentary. New features, as mentioned before, there is this administrative order process where the FDA can initiate a lot of these events on their own. There's also the um, ability for the, uh, the manufacturer to initiate these. And so this is through a process called your OTC monograph order request, where the manufacturer can say, this or this or this needs to be changed in our monograph um, to try and help with these changes. We need to clarify the status. So all of the drugs that were previously stuck in phase two or phase one, we need to finalize those monographs. We need to determine whether or not they meet criteria for generally recognized as safe and effective or whether or not those ingredients um, should be excluded. We need a process for minor changes in dosage forms or formulations. Um, and the potential too to consider this exclusivity. Again, if all of this effort and work is put into this to get these drugs approved for being over the counter, there should be some reward, some incentive to get this process done. Um, this also utilizes the OTC monograph user fees to provide those resources. And then additionally, there is the component of providing formal meetings with the FDA and the manufacturer sponsor so there can be an open dialogue. So they can talk about what is needed next, what the safety concerns are, what limitations are with the current monograph to really provide that access to the FDA. So in the past, all of this had done through rulemaking, which was, as we mentioned before, is multi-step process that uh, was pretty prolonged. Instead, what we are, the CARES Act is offering is the administrative order process. And so what this is, is the FDA will issue a proposed order uh, and notify the manufacturer about two days before issuing this. This order is going to have reasons for the issuance. It's going to provide a time for a public commentary period. And following this, it is going to issue a final administrative order. Uh, so it is cutting down these steps significantly. Um, this is going to give the FDA the authority to do the changes and to establish um, our monographs that were previously stuck in monograph purgatory. Uh, it's going to give the opportunity to expedite safety concerns. So again, if there is concerns about the patient population that's included in the monograph label about the specific ingredient or combination active ingredients, the FDA can safely and quickly um, address those concerns. There are two parts to this. You have your administrative order, which we technically you usually think about as the FDA initiating, um, but then you also have an industry initiated administrative order. And so this is through your OTC monograph order request, where the industry itself says, these are some changes that we would like to have with the monograph. Um, and so these are the things that we want to review. So let's talk a little bit 
about the fees. Um, again, there are two different types. One of them is the establishment fees. So this is an annual fee that is paid by the facility that manufactures the end product, the final product that is going to be distributed. Um, and so every year per year, you are going to be paying this fee. Uh, in 2022, uh, this would range between 16,000 to 24,000, depending on your designation. And then in addition to that, you have these user fees for your owners. Um, these are really dependent if you are requesting a change with the monograph. If you are not requesting these, you are not asked to pay these. Uh, but you do have two different types. You have the first one, which has bigger change requests. Uh, and so this is about a half a million dollars uh, versus a tier two, which has smaller changes that we'll talk a little bit more. But with these, this provides the FDA these resources to go out to hire people uh, so they can go through this process. Uh, and these fees are due upon submission of your OMAR. They are not an annual fee. This is a one-time fee per OMAR. So this was really modeled after the Prescription Drug uh, User Fee Act of 1992. So in 1992, uh, the average time that it took the FDA to review a new drug application for a prescription drug was anywhere from two and a half to eight years. Um, and a lot of times this wasn't because the review process was um, particularly difficult. It was just that there was such significant backlogging. And so the FDA identified that if we had increased personnel, if we had better equipment, we could more rapidly go through this. Um, but Congress really didn't want to increase the FDA appropriations through the budget. And so um, hence was born the PDUFA or Prescription Drug User Fee Act of 1992, which required a fee upon submission by the manufacturer. And this was a five-year process. And with instituting this, the patient or the FDA was able to hire hundreds of new people and train them. And from before, where it took uh, between two and a half to eight years for your NDA to be reviewed, following the act, uh, following this in action, uh, it changed this down to um, 18 months, um, two years, excuse me, uh, 18 months to two years. And so because of the benefits of this, this was actually um, reinstituted again uh, in five years and has um, continued to uh, be signed into law every five years since then because the, uh, the manufacturers are willing to pay if it means getting their drug to market that much sooner. And the FDA is willing to continue with their performance goals if it means having these resources. And so looking at that, when we are looking at the OTC monograph reform, what they found is that ones that had met the NTA criteria had these extra um, resources that were allocated to them versus the monographs did not. And the monographs, again, are spanning decades and decades of medications that have been available. And so they proposed something very similar to this Prescription Drug User Fee Act, where this is the uh, manufacturers of the OTC drug uh, will pay a fee when they request these changes that will help support having new um, staff, hiring new staff, being able to review these, and a couple other things. Uh, there is focus on the IT components of this, developing a platform so that you can electronically submit. So in the past, a lot of these had been boxes and boxes of papers that were sent to the FDA to review. And so not only is that review process really prolonged, things then have to get archived and can get lost pretty quickly. This makes this all electronic. It's easy to archive your review work. It's easy to generate reports, catalog monograph documents. And then a lot of this, again, is eliciting public feedback and being very transparent with the public. So making sure that there is an appropriate dashboard in place that allows that conversation between the FDA and the public. With this, um, as we mentioned before, by 2024, year four, 50% uh, of those OMAR submissions uh, received will issue a final order by the specified goal date. By year five, 2025, 75% of the OMAR submissions received will issue a final order by the specified goal rate. And again, if they continue to meet those, the discussion will be whether or not this is something that should be continued to be a part of our process for our monograph review. In looking at these, you have the two different types of your OMARs. 
you have your type two, which are pretty minimal changes. They are reordering of the existing information that's already in the drug back label. This is standardizing the concentration or dose of the finalized ingredient. Uh, ingredient. This is nomenclature change, so potentially uh, making given and administer interchangeable. Um, this is adding additional information to the other information part of that drug label. Um, or modifying slightly the directions of use. These are all pretty small changes. Um, and so with that, your cost is quite a bit less compared to tier one, where you are potentially introducing a new ingredient for this drug therapeutic class. You're introducing a new indication, a new combination of these active ingredients that have previously been designated as grace, new testing methods, new route or administration. Um, and so anything that is a higher level than tier two falls into this tier one. And if you meet those criteria, then potentially you have this exclusivity for 18 months. And so if you have done all of these things and you have put up forth the fees for this, you have shown that this is safe to be used like this, then being able to capitalize on that for the next 18 months. These are kind of a demonstration of back to back of what these look like. And as you can see, the FDA and industry initiated orders are very similar once you get to step three. It's just a matter of who is initiating this process. If it is the FDA, a lot of these are like safety changes or concerns or ones when they review the label or again, finalizing that monograph. Uh, and there's no fee for the uh, manufacturer versus an industry one where the industry is recognizing these are the changes that we would like to offer. These are the things that we think need to change. Uh, and so this is a industry initiating this, going to the FDA, requesting that these changes be happen. Um, and again, these are associated with the different fees depending on what the ask is. Additionally, with the CARES Act, you can also have your expedited FDA order. And so this is when you recognize that the drug poses an imminent public safety risk. And so making sure that this can rapidly be assessed and changed. Uh, so for this, the FDA will issue an interim order that becomes effective prior to any public commentary. And then there will still be a period of public commentary before this becomes finalized, but a lot of this can be added on prior to, so you have that time to manage the safety concerns. Again, with the exclusivity uh, component, these are changes other than safety, where we really recognize uh, that these are new things about the drug that are still drugs that we think are safe for the public to use. Really, the time period that you can be considered exclusive is one of two things. When a drug contains an active ingredient not previously incorporated in certain specified drugs, or when there is a change in the condition of the use of the drug, um, where they will now have the exclusive rights um, to uh, the studies that are essential to issue this order. And so these big changes say that Yes, you are able to have this on your own for the next 18 months so that you can uh, have some of the financial benefits of going through this process. Now, talking a little bit over to NDAs. So, for example, your monograph items, you have things like um, acetaminophen, you have um, things like diphenhydramine versus your NDAs where you have drugs that are like Claritin, Aleve, Miralax. And this is really the alternative regulatory option for legally marketing an over-the-counter drug. Um, this is one that has not previously been designated as generally recognized as safe and effective and thus requires a new drug application, it just requires showing that this drug is safe before marketing it. Um, and as soon as you have your NDA approval, then you can market the drug. And again, it is a finished drug product specific as opposed to an active ingredient specific. During this time period, there's a couple different requirements. Um, you need to show the clinical test results. You need to show what is included in this drug. Uh, you need to show how, what it looks like with animal studies what it looks like within the body, uh, drug behavior, and the making sure that the standards for the manufacturing, processing, labeling, and packaging of the information is performed in a safe, effective manner uh, with drug a final drug product that is safe and effective for use. When we look at these back to back, there's a couple of things that are notable of changes. First, with your OTC, NDA versus your monograph, it's really about is there pre-market approval that's required? 
Additionally, with the OTC product, this is a confidential filing versus with the OTC, you are really heavily eliciting public feedback about this process. Again, with your NDA, this is a drug product specific versus with your monograph, this is an active ingredient specific. Both of these involve user fees. Um, though the OTC monograph only requires the OMARs if the industry is actively requesting these changes. Both of these have the potential for marketing exclusivity, uh, though there is a difference in the time frame three years versus 18 months. Um, both of these have timelines for the FDA to review this um, to meet those criteria. With the NDA, you have to submit clinical data. And if you are looking at an over-the-counter drug, oftentimes you are looking at label comprehension, how this drug is used in an over-the-counter sense to make sure that that's safe. Versus a monograph, you don't require those clinical studies beforehand. With your NDA, your labeling is unique to your drug. Versus with your monograph, it's really defined by that monograph category. And once marketed, the FDA has the ability to review that labeling at any time. With your NDA, once you get your approved NDA, then you can license that drug, you can market that drug. Versus with the monograph, as soon as that monograph is out there, anybody whose drug meets that monograph requirement uh, can go ahead and market that drug. We're gonna look a little bit at the label comparing the two. So you have two examples. One is Benadryl, which is an over-the-counter monograph antihistamine compared to Prilosec, which is an over-the-counter new drug uh, application. And as you can see, they're very similar. This is because of the drug facts uh, rule of 1999, where it really required not only there to be a standardization of the content, but also the format of this. And so you can see these are very similarly done in this similar and in the same order too. On the top, you have the requirement up at the top left of having your drug facts. Following this, you have your active ingredients, purpose, use, warnings, direction, other information, and inactive ingredients. The final category that's available here is questions or comments, and this is an optional requirement, and you can see with the Benadryl that it's done, it's available um, at the bottom, uh, at the bottom part, versus on the Prilosec, you don't see that listed on the back label. Everything about this label is highly regulated. You have a hierarchy of the way that the warnings are listed. You have a requirements for the text size. So when they were looking at this in the 1990s, they did some studies and they found that patients that were greater than 60 had a hard time reading any drug product that had a text that was smaller than uh, 6.7. Um, but recognizing the limitations with the size of the product, they made it mandatory that your text had to be at minimum a 6.0 um, to be listed on there to make sure that it was as available as possible so that the clients could appropriately interact with that product. Transitioning a little bit now to our prescription side of this. Remember that a prescription is something that requires your healthcare provider to assist uh, with you using that product. So for some reason, whether or not there is toxicity, uh, there's potential for harm, the method of the use, or the things that you need to make the determination of whether or not that drug should be used, this is what puts this in the prescription category. This is what requires this learned intermediary to supervise your uh, treatment and management of your condition. There are a couple different ways that you can go from a prescription to an over-the-counter product. With these, uh, you have a couple different options. Uh, going from prescription to over-the-counter, you can do a complete where every population and indication that you have as a prescription is the same that you have as an over-the-counter product. You have this partial switch where certain populations, certain indications are okay to be used as over-the-counter, but the rest of them stay as prescription. We'll give some examples of those in a minute. You have a direct to over-the-counter um, new drug application. And so this drug has never been marketed before as a prescription, and you are introducing it to the over-the-counter market first. Um, or you have these things where your drug product deviates from the OTC monograph. So again, for example, you have uh, things like your RID mousse. This mousse was, when they initially created the monograph, um, was not a formulation that was available. And so in order to market this in the over-the-counter um, over market, uh, you had to apply for an NDA. 
Um, and then you also have your generic, which is your abbreviated new drug um, approval as well too. Looking at these, when you are looking at the application process for an NDA versus uh, with an over-the-counter versus a prescription, there's a different focus. For the prescription, you're really focusing on the new chemical entity. How safe, how effective is this agent? Uh, and wanting to make sure that the healthcare provider um, has the prescribing information that they need for this. Uh, this requires user fees and you do have uh, different exclusivity terms for your new chemical entity. Comparing this to an over-the-counter where the really focus is, is this drug safe when there is not the supervision of the healthcare provider? Can the consumer correctly identify whether or not this drug is one that they can use? Uh, do they understand the label? Can they self-diagnose and self-select uh, for whether or not this is the appropriate drug for them? Looking really focused on the product label because this is what's available to the consumer to help guide how they use this medication. Uh, there really is no requirement for prescribing because again, this is not a prescription drug still requires a user fee. There is a little bit of a difference as far as who um, oversees the advertisement for the OTC. This is the Federal Trade Commission versus the prescription product. This is the Federal uh, the FDA. Um, both of these have a review process. And again, there is some differences with your exclusivity. So why do we switch it? Well, there is a lot more of us than there was in the 1930s. And we're a lot older um, as a country than we used to be. And so with this, potentially there's some drugs out there that patients could uh, manage on their own without having to come into a healthcare provider every couple months to renew this prescription. So an example of this is Bolteran gel for osteoarthritis. This is something that has pretty uh, limited systemic toxicity, something that can be um, applied by this patient population can really help manage um, chronic pain related to over-the-counter products. Um, and the consumer appreciates this too because it means that they don't have to utilize their healthcare resources quite as much. It also makes some business sense. So if you are a drug that had previously been patented, you're looking at running at the end of that five year, and this is gonna be a significant change in your profit margins when you have significant competition by your generic manufacturers. If you can look at releasing this as an over-the-counter product, then you still potentially can have the three year of exclusivity as a over-the-counter product when we think that this is safe for the consumers to use. And so this can increase your profit margins and it can also create uh, brand recognition for patients who are using this as a brand, as a prescription product and now are able to use this as an over-the-counter product. Um, these prescription changes too, there's one study that said um, that they've made a huge um, gain for your over-the-counter um, growth. Uh, so this has contributed about, they've estimated in one study, 31% of the growth of over-the-counter products is due for, to these prescription to over-the-counter switches. So in the United States, there are certain criteria that you have to meet to do these switches. First of all, again, can your consumer correctly diagnose, treat, manage, and self-select uh, with this drug? Do you need a healthcare provider to oversee to make sure that they're using this safely? Is there an acceptable safety margin? Is there a low concern for significant toxicity when it's used as directed? Um, does the benefit of having it out there um, outweigh the risks? And is there really low potential that this will be abused or misused? As we mentioned before, there's different categories with this. Um, and so some of these with your new over-the-counter ones are things like um, where you have no, when you do a full switch, it's no population or indications left behind. So some examples of these are Miralax, Rhinocort, Nasacort Allergy 24, uh, nicotine lozenges. All of these had previously been a prescription drug and they, for all the same population, all the same indications, they are now available over the counter. You also have things that are partial switches. So for example, these are um, some indications or some populations may remain as a prescription. Um, Oxytrol. Oxytrol is available for women for overactive bladder, but for men it remains a prescription drug. Or you have things that are indication-based. So for instance, you have topical um, 
antifungals that are available for athlete's foot, ringworm, jock itch as over the counter. But if you are treating tinea versa color, this requires a prescription indication. Or proton pump inhibitors. Uh, this is okay to be used for heartburn for over the counter, but if you are treating ulcers, if you're treating erosive esophagitis, um, these remain a prescription. You have your, um, also two, your direct to OTC. So these are things like your Abriva, where it was not previously marketed and is now available as an over-the-counter product. Um, you also have things like uh, different types of sunscreen that had reduced UVA exposure. They were not previously available as prescription, but you were look at uh, getting them out as an over-the-counter agent. So in order to do the switch, there's a couple different studies that are different for an OTC NDA compared to a prescription NDA. One of these is the label comprehension studies. And so what this really does is it assesses whether the consumer understands a drug facts label based on scenario-based questions. Uh, these are done with FDA guidance and it, um, part of this, you wanna make sure that you include in your cohort patients who have low literacy. Going back to Oxytrol, some of our examples for this is you give a scenario. Janet has overactive bladder. She's been using the product for a few weeks, but seems to be getting worse. According to the label, what, if anything, should Janet do? Or another example of this is Cindy has glaucoma. She's recently determined she has overactive bladder and would like to start treating with this product. According to the label, what, if anything, should she do? So we're trying to see if the patients can correctly identify whether or not um, this product should continue to be used or should be used in the first place. Then you have your self-selection. And so this is really testing whether or not the consumer can determine if the drug is right for them to use by applying um, this information to their own personal medical history. Um, this can be targeted to specific patient populations to ensure that the data is gathered in group settings. It can include, it needs to include consumers of low literacy. Uh, again, it's going to follow FDA guidance. Um, and really, this is a, is this product appropriate for you to uh, treat your symptoms? So uh, again, looking at oxytrol with overactive bladder, um, is this product appropriate to treat your symptoms of frequent urination, strong need to urinate right away, or inability to control the urge to urinate? Can the patient self-recognize overactive bladder or recognize that it is or is not things like a urinary tract infection, pregnancy, diabetes, bladder cancer? So making sure that they can select it with that. Um, you have your actual use studies, which are clinical studies that kind of simulate an over-the-counter use. Uh, there's a few exclusion criteria. There's minimal healthcare oversight. This can be like things like pharmacy-based enrollment, um, where they really assess the compliance to the drug facts label. So your primary endpoint with these is the proportion of patients who didn't stop when they developed new symptoms or had symptoms worsen. Secondary endpoints can be median time to discontinue the use for those who didn't experience improvement after two weeks. Proportion of those who misuse the product, the incorrect duration of use or simultaneous use with another product. Then you have your human factor study. Um, so this can really test whether or not the patient can interact appropriately with the product. So for example, with your nasocore 24 allergy, were the patients able to perform the tasks needed uh, for the use and maintenance of this product? Were they able to prime and reprime the pump? Were they able to manage a clock pump? Were they able to interact with it appropriately? Um, other studies that are sometimes in, that need to be included as well too are clinical studies that can be specific to the agent that we're looking at switching. Um, these can look to support efficacy, benefit, and risk assessment. Um, and looking at the marketing claims. So for example, with your over-the-counter PPIs, did these mask signs of gastric cancer? Did they delay uh, time to care because they were masked by symptoms with the PPI? Um, you're gonna look at epidemiological studies because the, is there rare or unusual safety concerns that come about when patients are using these without having the prescription label? And then attitude and usage studies. So this is real-world behavior of the consumers, patients, and healthcare providers. So who really initiates the switch? Well, the patient who hold, or the person who holds the NDA can initiate the switch. Uh, citizens can petition for this, but this is not an FDA initiated process. They do not conduct the studies to support these changes. This is industry or citizen initiated. And a lot of this is making sure that this is safe uh, for these patients to be using. This is looking at this in um, all of the time that it's been available as a prescription drug. What is the published literature that's out there on this? What is the pharmacovigilance? Um, what is recognizing that this was done in context of prescription label? How is that going to change with an over-the-counter label? 
ultimately this is going to result in FDA approval uh, and requiring a judgment call. Uh, there's two different divisions that are helped with this regulatory process, but this can be a really difficult decision. Oftentimes there's not precedents that are there um, beforehand. Consumer behavior studies are very often very gray and there can be very mixed results with these. And so trying to interpret all this data to whether or not this is safe can be difficult. Um, again, the benefits of this are that you continue to have pharmacovigilance once it is, you have things like MedWatch, you have your providers who are seeing whether or not there's adverse effects. Um, but a lot of times these have resulted in benefits when done under those, uh, when they meet those criteria uh, for the patients to have access. So that concludes um, the part of this lecture here. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions um, or thoughts that anybody has. Sasha, that was a terrific talk. I have a question for you. Um, can you give an example of whether or not there has ever been a med medication that has gone the reverse way from over the counter to RX? I think there probably is. I don't remember off the top of my head, um, but I, I believe that there is. I'll have to get back to you. Okay, yeah, because that'd be interesting to see see if, if what what the process is in the reverse reverse order. Um, we are um, at time, but if anybody has a question, um, please feel free to ask. You can ask in the chat or raise your hands. Um, in the meantime, I've got a couple of other questions, Sasha. If you do have time, um, do you know how things like MedWatch um, impact? Like reporting to MedWatch impacts the the process from RX to OTC. Are 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 there is there like a pharmacovigilance thing um, that helps expedite or slow that down? Um. So in looking at these, these are regulated or monitored pretty closely right after they were released as an over-the-counter because we recognize that there is high potential for misuse or for um, use when it when they self-select inappropriately. Um, and so I think they are, there's been um, a lot of publications on this, for example, with your PPIs looking to see, does this change our um, gastric cancer concerns with these patients? And so um, while this is, there's lots of publications, there's a lot of really increased uh, notice and increased focus on these drugs. Um, a lot of this continues to be implemented by providers um, and other patients who are recognizing that there's um, bad symptoms and reporting those. Interesting. Okay, Marcel Casabant has a question. Um, acetaminophen violates so many of these OTC rules. Might the FDA ever retroactively re revoke the OTC status for a baby like this? Yeah, so these, these are hard, right? Because a lot of these are done when your product is used within the appropriate label. Uh, and so for acetaminophen, if you actually use it as prescribed, this should be a safe medication. But as we know, because this medication is available, there is tons of people who overdose on this medication daily. Um, and so I think that they're... Um, this is potentially one of the reasons why that medication had such a prolonged period where it was in the tentative uh, final monograph phase. Um, and part of this again goes back to the benefits versus risks of having this widely available. Uh, if used in the right way, this is a great drug to manage pain, manage fever, um, but the risk is always when your consumer gets a hold of it uh, and they are able to use it in whatever way you see fit, especially if you have things like Costco sized bottles uh, where you just have access to a lot of them. It just makes it um, hard. And so I think that that is something that is monitored um, and watched. And that's one of the reasons why they had such a uh, detailed and complicated process to do the review was because there's lots of times where these things fall out a little bit and you're like, if you do everything right, this is a great drug and it should be safe. But if we um, start to have the consumer and you change this benefit versus risk component to it. Um, and so that's definitely resulted in changes in the monograph or pulling things because of those concerns. 
And remember, you know, it's against the label to overdose, right? So, so the label is really the law. So it, it, that, and we looked at, at our last uh, webinar was on labeling in, in particular. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can go um, watch those videos. Um, anybody who's uh, on this. So our previous uh, uh, webinars have been recorded. So yeah, so labeling is really important. And uh, so following the labels uh, uh, a big thing. That said, um, uh, acetaminophen, I think falls in the category as generally recognized as safe and effective. Isn't that correct, correct Grace? It's that Grace? Yeah, it was. Um, and I don't know if it has officially been meet the criteria for final monograph since the institution of the CARES Act. Uh, prior to the CARES Act, it was still in that tentative. Um, finalized monograph where it still was considered as a category one or generally recognized as safe and effective, it just had never made it through that final process. Um, so I'm not sure where it is right now following the CARES Act, but it was still in that category of generally recognized as safe and effective. Excellent. Well, we are at 12.05. I don't know if anybody else has any final parting questions before we go. Sasha, that was a fantastic lecture. Um, and Sasha will be back uh, along with the other fellows for our next webinar um, in June. So um, looking forward to seeing you all. Thank you very much for attending um, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks Thank very you much. For your time. Have a good one.